11 to 30, so I guess we're just about ready to start. Um, my presentation is called Seeing the Source, and it's about redefining awareness. So, if this were your usual presentation on poverty, we've all heard them before. It would go something like this. I would tell you that 1.7 billion people in the world live in absolute poverty. I would tell you that 40% of African children die before their fifth birthday. I would show you some sepia toned photos of children in poverty, <laughs> as well as my own. <laughs> and I would tell you that you can make a difference, but only if you donate now. <laughs> this is a very well intentioned <coughs> presentation. The facts are right, and the cute children do succeed in getting more dona donations. So, what's wrong with this? Well, the fact is, it doesn't work. Fundraisers have been organized, donors mobilized, and dollars contributed, and yet we all hear the reports about how poverty is just as extreme as ever. If you've learned anything about our failed attempts to eradicate poverty, it's that raising awareness isn't the issue, as long as we're defining awareness as merely being conscious that there's suffering out there. What I believe is that we need to redefine awareness. We need to redefine the type of awareness that really matters when we're trying to solve these problems. So. What is this kind of awareness? It's an awareness not just of what's happening in the world, but why it's happening. It's an awareness of the root causes of poverty, of our prejudices and our assumptions. It's an awareness of the forces behind suffering. It's what's called critical awareness. Let me give you an example. So our poverty interventions don't work. And so we go back to the drawing board. And these are the questions we ask. And these are great questions. And they do need to be asked, but they're not nearly enough. Instead of asking how many people die every day of HIV AIDS, we need to be asking why do people die every day of HIV AIDS? Instead of how is the world affected by envi environmental change, how are different societies affected by environmental change? Instead of how do we solve poverty, how do we define poverty? And instead of in what ways are people suffering in the world, why are people the fact is that we need to be aware of more than problems. We need to be aware of root causes, of our own prejudices, and of the deeper issues that drive suffering around the world. So then we have to answer the question, well, what are we unaware of? Maybe a better question is, what was I unaware of? This is me at the beginning of the program. I have my shovel, my boots, and my basket, everything I need to go plant trees and save the world. I also had this naive idea that if everyone did what I was doing, then somehow we'd be able to solve the problems of the world. That if we mobilized enough volunteers, enough money, we'd be able to make this world a more peaceful, fairer world. And that's what poverty campaigns tell us. That one more dollar, that a couple more dollars, a couple more volunteers, and poverty will be eradicated someday. This is an illusion. It's because we're not being aware of what really matters when it comes to solving these problems. All right. So these are, in my opinion, the three most important to me areas of awareness in our world today. Number one, number one, how world structure perpetuates poverty. Basically answering the question, why poverty? Why suffering? And looking at the institutions in our world that allow poverty to exist um, as a natural consequence of our structures. Number two, the developed world prejudice. Basically, as wealthy, developed nations, what do we assume about the rest of the world? What do we think about other cultures? Um, and number three, the source of unawareness. Basically, why do I need to make a presentation on this? Why does TDB even exist? Why isn't this common knowledge? All right, so let, let's embark on our first point. How a world structure perpetuates poverty. So, over the past year, as I saw firsthand these examples of suffering, of South African towns plagued by HIV AIDS, Indian children running the streets looking for spare change, and even here in DC, homeless people sleeping on the side of the road. These experiences provided not answers, but questions. Why is there suffering? Why poverty? How is it that we are wealthy while others are not? And stories of poor kids orphaned by HIV AIDS and malaria affected mothers, these are important stories and they're essential to knowing what, it like, what, it, what it's like to live in these circumstances. But if we want to answer the question, why poverty, then these stories are not enough. We must be aware of the larger, often invisible institutions and structures behind suffering. In other words, we must be aware not of the tragedy of one, but the oppression of millions. 
tragedy is, tragedy does not happen in the vacuum. It does not happen in isolated pockets. There are patterns throughout the world that explain the suffering. <coughs> so, this is a big question. Why is there suffering? I can't possibly hope to answer that question for you today. I don't have the answers. After TBV, I can only begin to, to, throw, to, to throw out some ideas. Over the past year, we've read authors who've devoted their lives to studying these structures and the roots of poverty. And these are the people that connect the dots. These are the people that see the patterns between the individual topics of tragedies in what is called constellational thinking, connecting the dots. And so what have I come away with after reading these authors? This idea of structural violence. This is the idea that violence does not have to be direct. It does not have to be beating someone up or murder. It can be any process by which an individual is incapacitated and his or her ability to pursue the life they, the, the life that they desire is somehow prohibited in some way. Sexism, racism, any institutions like that. Let me, give, let me explain this further. So, when you think of human rights violations, what do you think of? Well, maybe I think of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. I think of the Cambodian genocide that we saw in um, Cambodia, the killing field. I think of our, our latest favorite villain, Cody. This is the example of direct violence. This is the in-your-face oppression that tugs at our heartstrings and makes us aware of the cruelty of, of humankind. But this is not structural violence. However, when we see black townships afflicted by HIV or Cambodian girls grounded for food, or Haitians who die of very preventable TB. There's no easy pointing of the fingers here. Who's to blame for this? There's no Coney here to account for this suffering. This, and this is certainly a human rights violation, there's no denying that these people have been deprived of their opportunity to pursue life. This, this is structural violence. Basically, the fact is, we live in a world under oppression by the world's wealthy. Not the 1%, that's the, that's the target of the Occupy movement today, the, the big bankers. That's, it's not that. Those are the oppressors aware. It's people like you and me, the oppressors unaware. The fact is that we live in a world for the rich, where equality of opportunity is secondary to the freedom of the rich to accumulate in excess. We live in a world where there's more food to go around, food is every day to feed the world, and yet millions, billions go unfed. We live in a world where, in which being a superpower, being the country that gets to influence other, other weaker countries for its own gain, is something we take pride in. We live in a world where elaborate economic processes have impoverished many for the wealth of a few, and we call that capitalism. Let me give you an example. Take globalization. We have this idea that with enough time and money, through the globalized economy, we'll be able to lift poor countries out of poverty. This is an ecological impossibility. Even if we want to elevate India alone, and it's 1.2 billion people to a Western level of consumption, there, the world does not have nearly enough oil, nearly enough resources to make this possible. The fact is that the most advanced economies in the world have already taken up most of the world's resources, leaving no room for other countries at the top. Because of that, globalization cannot equalize the world. Instead, globalization only fuels the extravagance of developing nations. The idea that we can raise the rest of the world to our level of consumption without any sacrifice on our part is an empty illusion that only justifies our excesses. This brings me to this quote. This is a quote from a Jesuit priest working for the Honduras poor. He was killed by U.S. trained security forces in 1983. Do we North Americans eat well because the poor in the third world do not eat at all? Are we North Americans powerful because we help keep the poor in the third world weak? Are we North Americans free because we help keep the poor in the third world oppressed? A couple weeks ago, we attended this conference called the Challenge Accepted Conference. It was, for, it was a conference basically aimed at youth empowerment, looking at the issues of the world and how we can think about these in a better way. And it's a very noble goal, and it's a very, it was a good conference. But the problem that I had with it is a problem that I think that many people are aware of. The fact that in one room, you'd have people talking about how to solve world hunger, how to cure HIV AIDS. And in the next room, right after that, you'd have people talking about how to increase United States supremacy, how to increase US military force around the world. Without realizing that these are very interconnected issues. 
The fact that the United States is a superpower inherently means that there are all these countries below us. The fact that there is this power disparity, that's what it means to be a superpower. Human rights can't just be another item on the agenda, along with everything else we you know. If taken seriously, human rights puts our own interests as a superpower into question. Right. So, the second area of awareness that I'd like to talk about is the developed world prejudice. What we assume about the rest of the world that we don't even know is true. So, if I were to show you this picture, what would come to mind? How does it make you feel? A lot of people might look at this and they think of poverty. They see the girls with dirty clothes and no shoes standing next to this wooden house. And that's what poverty means. And that's what poverty meant to me before this trip. I would see this and I would say, this is poverty. That leads to the question, what is poverty? We look at this, and we're used to thinking of this as poverty. But people who don't have what we have, who don't have mach washing machines, canned foods, or, or Toyotas, the fact is that poverty, in our eyes, is people who live not as we do. And we are completely unaware of the hidden prosperities behind this picture. This is my home state family in Los Naranjos, Ecuador. That's where that picture comes from. They're an indigenous Satula tribe. The fact is that what we miss out on is that these people have lived for just as long as we have. They've lived for just as long refining and adapting their lifestyle to their surroundings. To say that they don't know how to live and we do is ridiculous. And we see them as poor because they lack material goods. But the fact is that there's so much more to living, to living prosperous prosperously in today's world. For example, they have a sense of community that far exceeds anything we have in the United States. Their lives aren't perfect, and they have a lot of problems. But if they have problems, it's issues like gender empowerment, not issues like not having Coca-Cola in their fridges or Toyotas in their driveways. And yet, we see this picture, and we think poverty, because that's what we've been trained to think of when we see cultures completely different from our own. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. Needs are culturally defined. What are American values and needs? We value choice, the ability to choose one's life path. We value progress, the fact that things can always be better. We can always make better things. We value individual accomplishment, the fact that we value our personal achievements more over community. We value social mobility and the separation between work and life, very distinct things in our, in our world. And we value wealth accumulation, the fact that the more money we have, the better. Let me emphasize one thing about this, that these are American values and needs, and they are not inherent to living in this world. There are plenty of societies out there that, don't li that live outside of this. They live by their need, they live according to their surroundings. They, they, they're not necessarily occupied with wealth accumulation. Their work and their life are one and the same. And yet this is, this is I mean, we believe this is it. We believe that this is what every society needs to be modern and developed. What's the result of this? The result is the modernization of poverty. The fact is that poverty changes over time. 50 years ago, we didn't need washing machines and microwave ovens to be developed. But as the developed world gets more and more affluent and starts creating new needs like iPhones and laptops, our definition of what constitutes poverty around the rest of the world changes. Development is too often the creation of needs. Of going to a farmer that makes enough to sustain his family and saying, you're not making nearly enough. You can have more than this. Of saying, oh, so we occupy their life spaces and we show them pictures of Americans driving to dance or drinking Coca-Cola. And we tell them exactly why they're poor. We're continually creating new needs. New ways for the rest of the world to, to be deficient in their own eyes. And you may stop me here and you may say, Andrew, hold on. Doesn't giving them washing machines and dryers, doesn't that make their lives easier? Doesn't that make them happier? Aren't these good things to be given to them? Perhaps, perhaps it is. But the problem is that we're, we're creating so many needs that we can, simply cannot fulfill. We've created a divide between the rich world and the poor world. And we televise the rich world to the poor world so they know exactly what they're missing and exactly why they're inferior to us. The fact is that continual wealth accumulation and material goods are not inherent to being happy and prosperous in this world. Many societies have lived by fulfilling their need, not their greed. And yet we see such a society today, 
let me call them four. This is the modernization of poverty. It's caused by our assumption that everyone in the world needs to be like us, needs to possess like us, in order to be happy. Why is this possible? Why is it possible to have this mentality of disregarding other cultures? And I'd like to read you this poem to sort of make the point. Please dream of buying themselves a dog, and nobody dream of escaping poverty. That one magical day, good luck will suddenly rain down on them, will rain down in buckets. But good luck doesn't rain down yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. Good luck doesn't even fall in a fine drizzle. No matter how hard the nobody summon it, you get their left hand is tickling or begin the new day with the right foot. Or start the new day with the change of rules. The nobodies. Nobody's children, owners of nothing. The nobodies. The no ones, the nobody. Running away like rabbits, dying through life, screwed every which way. Who are not, but could be. Who don't speak languages, but dialects. Who don't have religions, but superstitions. Who don't have art, who don't create art, but handicaps. Who don't have culture, but folklore. Who are not human beings, but human resources. Do not have faces but arms. We do not have names but numbers. We do not appear in the history of the world, but in the police blotter of the local paper. The nobodies, who are not worth the build that kills them. Before this trip, I never questioned the language that I use. Of course, they're superstitions. They believe in these crazy things. They're not religions. They're, it's handicaps when you buy them as a tourist. This is the language that accurately reflects reflects how we view the rest of the world, and how we denigrate other cultures. So the question is, are we aware of our prejudices? Are we aware of what we assume about the world? Have we ever questioned whether this is true or not? So now we come to our third question. We just covered, of what are we unaware? And now we're moving on to, why are we unaware? We have to consider, why we are unaware of these structures, these ways of seeing the world. To answer this, first, I sort of want to identify some characteristics of the average American. Now, stereotyping is terrible. It's, it's a terrible thing to do. But when you're looking at general trends in society and ways of looking at cause and effect, it's sometimes useful to see. So I'm going to do it right now. And seeing as I'm an average American, we can talk about how I would characterize myself as a citizen of this country. So, starting from the top, I believe that I'm very self-made. I believe that my accomplishments are, are my own and that I should be given credit for them. That's a very American thing. I, there's an air of superiority of being part of the most powerful country in the world, of being in this privileged place. We're individualistic, we value personal achievement. We're very efficient. We believe time is money, and the more time we can save, the more we can do other things as well that can make us more productive. We're, so, we're somewhat narrow-minded. We don't know that much about the rest of the world compared to other countries. We value our freedom, above all, our freedom to do things. And we're given to stereotype, as I sort of just heard. <laughs> so, first, I'm talking about why we're unaware could go in any number of directions. But I just want to cover a few sort of reasons. First one is the air of security that we have. This is the idea that we are the hub of the world. That since America is a superpower, Everyone around the world can learn English and learn about American culture, but we don't need to learn as much about other cultures as they do about us. Here's an example of that. In China, we taught high school students English and American culture. Um, and this is the, they had an American class, that's what it was called. And these Chinese students want to go to school in America, want to go to college in America eventually. So they were learning English about American culture so that they could one day move to America. And walking into the classroom, can't see here, but they have these posters all over the walls about people they admire, the heroes. And the surprising thing is that they're all white. That their heroes are people like Justin Bieber, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Emma Watson. And looking up on it, there were barely any Chinese faces. The fact is that they know almost every they know more of Justin Bieber songs than I do. They know more about American culture than most. And yet, how many of us know Chinese celebrities outside of Yao Ming? and Jackie Chan. Before the trip, I couldn't even name the president of China. And yet, everyone in the world knows the name of Barack Obama and George Bush. There's this one-way flow of learning that everyone has to learn about us. Everyone has to pay attention to our culture and our politics. And we can be fine not knowing about other countries. 
it's an awareness. It's an unawareness that is very dangerous in our world, and it will come back to bite us if we don't become more aware of the rest of the world. We feel no need to learn about the rest of the world because we believe that the rest of the world aspires to be us. We need to change that. The next, the next aspect is American individualism. The fact is that the American dream is hinged upon the fact that individuals can make it. The fact that no matter where you start in life, America is a place where you can rise and you can seek opportunity and pull yourself by a bootstrap from poverty. So we have this idea that individuals are self-made that they take credit for their own successes. And we say the same thing about failures, that if celebrities and businessmen are successful because they made the right life choices, then druggies and homeless people are unsuccessful because they made the wrong life choices. The fact is that Americans are good at seeing individuals, at seeing individual cases of, of achievement. What we're worse at seeing are the bigger picture, the, the institutions and the patterns behind individual suffering because we're so individualistic, because we value personal accountability above all. We're a nation of self made And so it's very hard to see things like structural violence, to admit for once that maybe it's not us as individuals, maybe it's the institutions that prop us up, maybe it's these structures that are allowing us to be prosperous, that are allowing other people to fall through the wayside. Another aspect of American individualism. But maybe the best, the best way to consider why we are unaware is to consider what are we made aware of on a daily basis. Our attention is constantly being occupied and competed for by advertisements and news flashes telling us that the shade we're getting with our current razor isn't good enough. That how can we pay attention to things like structural violence and HIV AIDS when celebrities are getting pitched, athletes are getting signed, and babies are being cute without us? <laughs> Even when we hear about world news, it's all the drama. It's the military uprising the dictators, the politics. We, we read the news, and we get more and more informed every day, but rarely are our core assumptions challenged. That's what awareness is. It's challenging your core assumptions, not about being informed. And through all this noise, through all the noise that is constantly being streaming into our awareness, the poor people of the world, the oppressed of the world, are nobodies. They don't even factor in. They're not even on the radar. And so they die without a voice. Monsters exist, but they are too few in numbers to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the functionaries, ready to believe and act without asking questions. This is Primo Levy, he was a prisoner at Auschwitz. In the end, awareness is not about being informed, because then we are left at the mercy of media-filtered perspectives and political agendas. Awareness is about deconstructing what we assume to be self-evident, and leaving ourselves open to seeing ourselves and the world as if for the first time. Ultimately, awareness is just as much about being aware of why we're not aware, of seeing the noise that covers the truth in the world. A vision for a better world starts at critical awareness. It starts at seeing through the noise and seeing to the source of suffering. Thank you. which I, I, I certainly buy about the fact that, that these cultures, you know, the washing machines and electric shavers that are not the things that they need. But how did, can you talk about the needs for clean water and health care and, you know, what are the role of, of development or that our role, you know, that it should potentially be in those sorts of services, which seem to be very much more basic than the needs for stuff and, and sort of Western culture? Yeah, certainly. Um, the fact is that development, I, we've been talking about this, what is development, but you're right, things like clean water, things like those basic needs are necessary for people to 
live the life that they want, basically. And you can't live the life if you're getting sick from your water. But the fact is that um, oftentimes development is, and that's, that's right, but development is, in today's world, is often seen as making countries, other countries more like us, as, as these material goods, and not concentrating on the, the more necessary things. What is actually necessary in the world? Um, for a long time, I thought showers were necessary, and that all changed when I went to Ecuador. Um, but it's, um, it's the fact that we're creating so many needs around the world. The fact that Coca-Cola is in every single country we're in. No matter how rural, no matter how distant from, other, uh, from cities, Coca-Cola was everywhere. We, companies have created the need for Coca-Cola in all these places. And it's, it's sort of mind-boggling how Coca-Cola gets everywhere, but we still view these countries as too isolated to, to provide clean water. Well, that's basically why I talked about the authors that we read. The fact is that individual experience can't tell us about how the world works. We have to combine our experiences, to talk to authors who have combined those experiences and thought about the, how the world work, works in those ways. We can't rely on individual experiences, because then we're only seeing tragedy as an individual thing, not as an, in, as an institutionalized profession. Yeah? So, so Andrew, I agree with your point about Coca-Cola not being an necessity in life. But I think to some extent, you do have to create needs to uh, uh, sort of create jobs and, and uh, find meaningful work for people, and therefore you, you need to educate them to be prepared to do those jobs. So there has to be something for people to do. Um, so to me, that's the dilemma, is finding appropriate things and finding ways to meaningfully employ people so that they can Take care of the basic necessities like clean water. So it's a, a pretty good problem. It is. Um, but I, I do think that it's a very American concept that we need to find industrial jobs for, people, for, for, for these people in, in these countries. And the fact is that um, we're, there's this huge push for things to become more industrial, to become more globalized, for these, for these people to move out of the farms, move out of their villages into the city and to find. Um, white collar jobs or even blue collar jobs. But the fact is that I feel like we're not satisfied when people farm for only their needs. And, and which is perfectly capable which people are perfectly capable of doing. If everyone were to farm for their own need, they, they would we would have enough food to serve everyone. Yeah, but, but then how do you how do you address the fundamental problems of clean water and uh, better health care and things like that? So it seems like you have to establish some kind of some level of infrastructure in order to address the really no oh yeah, for sure. But the fact is that we're even if we're establishing establishing this infrastructure in the developing world, how, what, in what way are we doing it? Basically, even if we're promoting economic progress among these communities, are we doing it in a way that leaves them feeling inferior, as if they somehow had to had to be risen out of poverty by these white people? How, what is the method in which we're doing it? I, I agree that we need these things, and that people around the world do need help. It's not like poverty doesn't exist. But it's what are the mentalities that we're going into it with, and how are we leaving them feeling? Basically, at the end of it, because a lot of honestly, a lot of poverty is psychological. It's seeing that the rest of the world has what you don't, and it's feeling that the rest of the world has to help you up. Um, does that answer your question? I, I didn't really even have a question. I was sort of just wondering out loud, and you were helping me do that. Okay, great. Right. Thanks. Thanks for your thoughts. So, um, except the premise that. We see things through the lens of our own culture, and that you know our culture kind of so better than someone else's. Yet, one of the things that you know we focus on in our culture are things like gender equality, racial equality. Does that mean that if another culture doesn't believe in those things, that's perfectly fine as well? No, it's not. But it's that's always a hard question about what's the balance between respecting other people's culture and and sort of promoting things values that we think are are good in the world, and. It's a problem that, that I haven't really resolved for myself fully. But I think that it's, it's I think, it, again, it, the goals are correct. It's about how we're doing it. It's about, are we promoting, are we basically promoting the right mentality when we're going and, and we're basically trying to change the cultures? It's, 
it's, it's one thing to say, like, you're, you're not treating your woman correctly, we need women's empowerment here. It's quite another thing to say, your culture is primitive, you rely on these superstitions, on these, on these antiquated values. And so we need a whole revamping of the system, you need to become more industrialized, that's how we're going to empower you. It's hard, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But um, I, I just think that we need to be more aware of, of other cultures and of, of, of having that balance between respecting other cultures and trying to promote good progress. Yes. And here you talked about how um, in some of these locations the sense of community was something that we really appreciated, different than maybe we feel every day here in the United States. Could you just pick one of the communities you were in and just articulate their concept of community and what you saw as a difference from where you were in the Okay, yeah. Um, well, I guess the two countries in which I, I felt had the most community was were Ecuador and, China, and India. China has probably less community than we do. Um, in Ecuador, it was it was great. If you if you heard any of the other POLs talk about stories in Ecuador, um, there so it's, it's a very tiny community. Everyone in the community knows each other. And, and sitting in, in our house, we have people streaming in just from neighboring houses, just coming in to chat, and basically the whole family being there under one roof. And it was this community that looked out for each other. And sort of on a side note, I was talking to, um, we had this activity where we had to ask people what is poverty on the streets in New York. And I asked this um, Pakistani taxi, taxi driver um, what is poverty, and he talked about being in poverty in the United States. And eventually I asked him, you know, is it worse being in poverty in the United States or is it worse being poor in Pakistan? And he said, oh, by far being in poverty in the United States. Because in the United States, people don't look out for each other as much. People are much more concerned about their individual achievement. And so in, pa in, in other co countries, it's neighbors take care of, the, of each other, the families take care of each other. And, and it's very rare to see sort of the separation of families that we see in the United States. Um, and even in the suburbs, we're very closed off from our neighbors. It's just a sense of community, of, of, of knowing everyone in the community and, and knowing exactly what's going on and being that form. Yes? You pointed out some significant problems that if we were to agree with you, you know, sh there should be some, you know, okay, now we, we've identified the problems. What are you thinking in terms of solutions? Well, the problem is that this is this has sort of been a theme of TV of being able to criticize systems very well, of being able to like basically shoot down every idea, but not having solutions. And I, I don't have the solutions myself. I think that it's start, but I do think. I, just, I do firmly believe that it starts at awareness. That social change cannot happen while people don't know what's going on. Individuals can't change the world without making people aware of why this is happening. So I don't think we can even begin to talk about solutions without first raising this critical awareness of the world. Yes? Okay, I really liked how you brought up the issue of perceived needs and um, brought it back to the role of not going in to try to solve gender equality or do this, but how you have to bring it back to the role of self. And I was wondering if along the trip we came back with any needs from learning from these other communities. Hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, Can you repeat it? Oh, um, she was just asking, I talked about the idea of perceived needs, of, of, of basically how we create needs, how we maybe create needs in other countries. And she was asking if I brought back any needs from other countries. If, I, if they taught me something about me. Um, and to be honest, I think they taught me more about what, what I don't need. But I do think that things like community, things like culture, like having a solid identity, as, as a, a cultural identity, is something that I never really thought, of, thought about before. I always thought like, oh, I, having a small group of friends is, is nice, and, and having people to rely on is nice. But that sense of community is something I've never experienced before in America. So coming back from that, it's sort of something that I'm much more aware of, of the sort of the isolation that we have in America. Yes? Do you think that when you're in these countries, that is a culture? I mean, when you're in India, that is a culture. When you're in the United States, there are many cultures on the same street. Right, yeah. It's, it, America is a, a huge melting pot. And, um, and for a while, I, I thought America was acultural, but of course, America has its own culture as well, coming back from it. Um, and America does have a lot of cultures, but I think one of the things that's interesting about America is that 
you look at like China and India, and they have this idea that we're exclusive, we, 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 we're the Chinese culture, you can't be like us. Or we're Indian culture, you can't be like us. In America, we have this idea that everyone can be like us, that everyone wants to be like us. And I sort of wonder whether this lack of single defined culture, American culture, makes us more prone to look at the other countries of the world and say like, oh, you can be like us, you should, you should be like us. And not having that sort of pride in being singular. My thoughts. Yes, that's a good point you bring up, Andrew, about uh, the melting pot of America and how when uh, people immigrate to the United States, the perception is to become American, to, uh, I guess, accept the ideologies and the, the cultural attachments of, of, uh, of America. Whereas, you know, I spend a lot of time in Canada, and when people immigrate to Canada, they sort of set up their little enclaves of, you know, the Indian uh, the Chinese community, and they're living in the same city, but within their own little sections, and it's only after maybe the second or third generation that uh, their children come sort of the Canadian identity. Right. So it, it's a sort of different kind of model, and uh, I, I like that observation. Thanks. Come to America, they're supposed to adopt the American values right away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And we sort of think of the diversity and we say, oh, we, we see so many diverse people, like we see Indian, we see, we see Asians, we see them everywhere. But the fact is that the people from India or from China that choose to come to America are a very specific breed of, the, of those people. They're the cream of the crop, they're people that believe in American values. And so we're actually not seeing the entire picture when we see immigrants from India or from China. It's, it's a very self-selecting process. Yes? This is maybe this is kind of a personal growth or introspection, but Having uh, gone on this EBB experience and identified a lot of things about yourself or other cultures, that, uh, especially this idea of the structural violence that you're seeing, and effectively you are an agent of, of the structural violence perpetuated by the United States as you traveled around, and hopefully, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you kind of break that down. But I'm curious if you thought you know, inwardly about what am I doing to influence these people based on what I've been brought to understand this right. the needs of Americans. Right. Um, yeah, totally. Um, I, I mentioned that when we taught Chinese students, we taught them English and American culture. And at first, I, I heard about that and I was like, oh, good, we're going to teach them English. Like, they want to learn English. But when you start to think about it, it's a very almost like imperialistic way of doing things. And all around the world, I would, I would pull up our program computers, our, our nice, fancy math books. And I sort of wondered how, how that affected their, how it affected them, like seeing this technology that, that we brought. Um, and of course, my Indian homestay family, they would always tell me, oh, we want to come to America. We want to like, be like you. We want to come to America. And I keep telling them, no, no, India is really, it's, India is a beautiful place. You live in a very beautiful village. And it's, it's hard, sort of, it's, it's hard thinking about your own footprint that you leave. Yes? Andrew, this is a relatively superficial question, but I was shocked when you talked about the Chinese school they had posters of Justin Bieber, right? I assumed that China, rural China, was relatively isolated from the rest of the world. Oh, How did they become China. it? Okay. Well, even then, how did they become so quickly polluted with American culture? <laughs> I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm shocked by that. I, I was shocked, too. Um, I honestly don't have the answer to that. I think as we live in a more globalized world, it's very easy for cultures to sort of to sort of cross. And as as the white face becomes the, the symbol for power, the symbol for prosperity in the world, I feel like maybe it's more likely to sort of adopt American celebrities as your idols. Wow. Yeah, I remember reading a, a book uh, written by a, a college grad who went to Beijing after she graduated. Uh, her, she'd grown up. Her her dad worked. Uh, for Foreign services. So she'd grown up in China a little bit, and then when she came back, and the only job she could get in Beijing, when she, I mean, even though she spoke uh, fluent uh, Mandarin, was uh, working on a soap opera set because they would hire uh, white uh, people to be models and billboards and posters and actors and foreigners and uh, you know on TV and whatnot. Oh, that's really cool. to what you want to do in the future. 
to be honest, I, I don't know. When we, when we sort of, we had this brainstorming session about what we're interested in, what, what, we're, what made, really made us passionate this year. And I think for me, it wasn't really any of the four topics that we uh, did, like environment, education, public health, or agriculture. I think it was more the idea of, of this idea of awareness, of, of what makes people believe what they believe. Like, how do we, why do we know, why do we believe we know things? And so it's the idea of like, what's the psychology behind how the world works and why it works this way. Um, so I don't, I don't know, uh, other than that, it's a very pretty vague answer, but I'm, I'm sort of undecided about what I'm going to study in college. Go, go fix it. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you 10 years. <laughs>